We have been talking about, we're going to continue to talk about, the different foundations that we build on. And what do we mean by that? There's certain key pillars that you can turn to inside of the Christian faith. Certain key ideas that if we would embrace these, if we would acknowledge these, there's a strength there. There's a a support. There's a way of approaching the world and approaching each other and approaching life that will enable us to to be in tune with who God is, how God's at work in the world, and and who we are, who God created us to be. And so the goal in this time is to reconnect with God. We want to come back to these core pillars. The world's been thrown into chaos. We need the solid ground to stand on. And our other goal is to reconnect one to another. To be people who, even though we've been scattered and all those other things that have come in between, either just a reality of distance or different conflicts and tensions based on all the things that happen, the Lord calls us to be one, to be united, to be whole. If we don't know what we are about, how can we function as God's people? I think we need to know what we're about. And being knowing, knowing what we're about is, is learning how to become centered, focused, aware, centered in a way that cuts through the distractions, cuts through the chaos of life, cuts through all the mess that might be there. So this is our goal, to look at the building blocks of faith and church and life and to let the Holy Spirit lead us and teach us day to day. Does that sound like a worthy goal? I hope so, because we're in it for a while. So I would encourage us, let's just take a moment, and let's just uh, spend some time in prayer. I need this this morning. I want to invite you to join me. Just part of becoming centered is intentionally connecting with God in the moment. So let's do that now. Lord, may your word be heard. May your spirit speak. May the hearts that are here and listening, Lord, may they respond to open up to you, to reevaluate, to see. Lord, we put our trust in you. We set aside our own will, our own thought on how the world should be. And instead, in these moments, we focus on you. Show us who we are. Show us who you are and help us to live well, attuned to you in these moments. This message is yours, and it's in your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read a passage for you. It's a fairly common one. It's found in 1 John chapter 4. And if you've been around me for a while, you know that 1 John is one of my favorite books in the Bible. It is just a, it's just a great message, a great book on who God is and what love is all about. So 1 John 4, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 12, says, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. He sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Amen. Where does love come from? Think about it. Where did you get the concept of love? Where did you land on what love looks like, what it causes us to do, what it should be? 
You know, I think we get this from all kinds of sources in all kinds of places. That the, the love that we know in this world, it, it's given to us, and perhaps initially through parents. That's a, the first one, right? Hopefully, in a healthier system, we experience love through that. Perhaps it's through a spouse or a child. Perhaps it's so, uh, something that people have used, a phrase, that phrase that to proclaim love, the phrase, I love you, has a lot of power in it, doesn't it? And in that power, sometimes it can be used inappropriately. How many of us have ever been injured by the concept and the word of love and how it's been used in our lives? This whole concept of love is so big. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so important to come back to the foundation. Because you hear it, right? The phrase, God is love, right? Love comes from God. Love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. There's not a lot of wiggle worm in that. Wiggle worm. It's going to be that kind of Sunday, folks. Wiggle room. There's not a lot of wiggle room in that. What the scripture's trying to say, and what I think we need to pay attention to, is that our understanding of love needs to come from the right source. And that is God. Because love gets confusing. Love can be a catch-all emotion. I mean, it gets plastered everywhere. It gets used in all kinds of ways. And uh, the examples that I've come up with, you've heard before, but I'm sure you can come up with your own. There are different things that you love. It could be you know, a house or a sports team or a, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, you can love your chair deeply, from what I understand from some people. You know, and, and so we have that connection, or even a car, or something like that. But those are all sort of temporary. There's another car, another chair down the road. Love can be a catch-all emotion in this, where everything can be loved, and we can feel loved by everything. How many of you, really seriously, how many of you have an emotional attachment to an inanimate object? Anybody? Yeah, own it. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, you, you see that picture, you walk by that piece of furniture, you, you know, whatever keepsake that might be from some past thing that draws a memory, you're like, oh, I love that. And if it, were, if it was gone, you'd miss it. It's okay to own that. You know, it's an expression of love. That's how one of the ways we understand it. It's also, unfortunately, love can be an excuse for abuse. If you love me, you will. Well, don't you know that I, I love you? You have to forgive me. There's just too many stories, folks. There's just too many stories of the word love being used to harm, to get your way at the expense of another. And in that, there are both victims and abusers. And the word love gets corrupted in its abuse. It can also be a very manipulative word. Love, it's what makes a, somebody, thank you, honey. I wanted somebody else to say it. It's what makes a Subaru a Subaru, right? Because obviously if you drive a Subaru, you love your children more than everybody else. That's just what that means. Sorry if anybody drives a Subaru. But it can be a manipulative tool. You know, like, oh, I'm going to use this to get you to buy this, or I'm going to get you to do this, you know, kind of thing. It doesn't rise to the level of abusive, 
but it definitely rises the level of manipulation. But beyond all of those things, love is life giving. Love comes from God. God is love. Those who love know God. Love is life giving. How many of you think, and I don't need to issue an example out loud, but let's just think of a time when you felt genuine love. Like, not anybody trying to get anything out of you. Or not anybody trying to use love to control you. Or not just a generic sense of love where it's just kind of like, oh, that makes me feel good. But like that love that, that's like this connection. Where it just impacts you and that other person that love that they're giving you, and it's just something that just feels so right and pure. I mean, there's obvious examples. There's obvious examples of, uh, in families, spouses, and children, and parents, and all of that, that you can use. There's moments, perhaps, that you can pick out and say, all right, that, then. That's what love looked like. Now, maybe there's some other messed up stuff that happened in other spaces, but there's probably a moment where it all just clicks, where it all makes sense, and that feeling that comes in that moment to be fully known and accepted, not because of what you can do, but just because you're loved. There's, there's no other thing that you can describe it. There's not another word you can use other than love. It's life-giving. It's those moments that can help us power through the more challenging ones that we have. You know, one of the, the things, the, the secret to a long and successful marriage, anybody here got it figured out? I'll write the book. I'll even give you some percentage of the proceeds if you got that one figured out. But the secret to a long and successful marriage, some would say it's resilience. It's the ability to, to put up with. But I think the secret really is a genuine love at the core. You know, I, I think a lot of folks, when they start talking about marriage and, and all this other kind of stuff, and even raising children or all of those kinds of things, they can start talking about it as if they know better than you how to be you. And one of the beautiful things about love is, you know what? It's not generic. It's unique. It's unique to every relationship. It's unique between people. And how we receive it and experience is, is complicated, but complicated in the best way. It's not the same. And what I have seen in, in several uh, marriages and people that I've known, even just people that I've talked to, even uh, people in the hospital that I visited, some of, I think I, I met one that was married 77 years. I feel like there's an age joke in there somewhere, but I'll leave it alone. 77 years, think about that. And holding hands with their spouse still. Now that's their way of expressing it. And the, all the nurses thought that was just the most adorable thing in the whole wide world. And it was. But what's the secret behind stuff like that? There's a connection that is deeper than conflict. It is deeper than the differences of opinion that crop up. It's deeper than what the outside world can inject in. 
It's stronger than any other relationship that might be. It's love. But it's not love in the sense of a Hallmark card. It's not the casual expression or thought. It's that love that gives life. And if you can find that, if you can find someone who's willing to give it and receive it, then you're going to find the strength that can only come from this place. Not only that, that love is an expression of who God is. I think what gets lost sometimes in our trying to define and understand what love is, is that we pull God out of the picture. As if love is this other thing, and then God sort of latches onto it. But love comes from God. God is love. The truest expression of love is an expression of how God relates to us. That connection that we call love, the deepest, most true, most pure form that we can find, the, even in its uniqueness and its diversity, is an expression of how God loves us. In fact, it's a shadow, a smaller expression of the love that God has for us. The strength, the resilience, the life, the hope, the joy that come from the connections that we have that are love-based, love-centered, in a true, pure sense. Those are pictures. Even just small pictures of the connection and the love that God gives us. And how do we know this? Because it's revealed to us. I mean, the writer, John, he uses, he's like, you want to know what this looks like? Here's what it looks like. God's love was revealed to among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Do you want to know what the truest, most pure expression of love is? Here is the example. Here is the picture. It is in Jesus. Where God took the action. Where God sent. Not because we deserved it. Not because it was an obligation or an expectation, but because he loves us. It wasn't what we brought into it that caused God to send Christ. It was his love for us as we are. His wish to be connected to us, to set us free from that which would keep us from him. That he would sacrifice in order to be connected to us. Love first came from God, not us. There's a sent nature of the Son. It was a choice. God chose to reveal his love to us. We are beloved, not because of what we do, but simply because God has chosen to give us this gift of love. I want us to sit with this for a minute. As we've heard the story so many times, one of the tricks so being in church is we've heard the story of Christ so many times that it almost robs it of its power. Because we've immediately, we've got these 
ideas that start jumping in our heads. Immediately, we've got this like, okay, well, this is what this means, and this is why I do this, and this is, and then, and even if you're like, well, I've heard, I know this story. I've read that book. I'm like, oh, well, I'll start paying attention again when he starts talking about something else. I want us to sit here for a minute. At the very core of the reason why we are here is an intentional choice by the creator, God, to send his son for us. It is love that is identified as the motive for this over and over again. This isn't just in 1 John. God's motive in creating is love. God's motive in delivering is love. God's motive for guiding is love. God's motive, given motive, is love. It's one of the reasons that I say love is always the right choice because it is the way that God engages his people. That's you and that's me. It is hard for us sometimes to look in the mirror and realize that we are beloved. It's used, John uses it a couple times just in this short passage. He says, beloved. The one who is loved is you. It's not just a theological concept. It's not something that just happened historically. It's not something we just talk about religiously in a church. It's not part of just some ritual. It's not something up there, out there, beyond. It is right here. What is the most true, most genuine expression of love? It's an intimate connection. Personal, unique complete in and of itself. And the greatest expression of that is the connection we have with God. We sometimes paint God in the picture of judge. And he is, but perhaps not in the way we sometimes talk about it. We sometimes equate God and his approach to us as condemnation. Look at all the things you've done wrong, you sinner. And God certainly will call us out on our sins and all the things that we've done. But that is not God's primary motive in engaging us. That is not where God comes first. It is always love. And the judge the one that convicts, that is always couched inside of the love of God. There's nothing that can ever separate you from the love of God. That's what Paul says in Romans, right? Nothing. And he starts to list all of the different things, height, death, even life or death, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And I want to suggest to you today that there is strength in this. There is a strength in this that is beyond what we acknowledge when we limit God's interaction to us to a church service or a ritual or a historic event or an idea. But there is strength in knowing that you are beloved. That you are loved by God. We can know this inside of our own lives. We can know it inside of our own experiences. Even just there's strength in knowing a child to a parent. Even when the child does something terribly wrong, where do they go often? Not always, but often. To the one who has shown them the greatest love. Because that's the safe, solid ground. It's an instinct. Even inside the the smallest kids. 
an instinct that we've had built into us. That when we sense a genuine love, a genuine connection, we can't help but respond to it. It's a place of safety. It's a place where we can be who we are. And that instinct that begins with a child, maybe the child isn't the one who has shown them the greatest love, might not be a parent, it might be a grandparent, it might be a teacher, it might be something buddy. But their instinct is when things start to happen, they're going to go to the one who has shown them the greatest love. I've shared this story before, just a brief one. I once wrecked my grandfather's truck. You guys remember that story? I was about 14, 15 years old, and he left it at my parents' house. My parents weren't home, and my sister and I decided we wanted to go for a drive. Um, and I felt like I was pretty awesome because I drove all around the farm, all around the, the, down the dirt road and back. I was all good until I tried to park it back in the garage. And I missed the um, brake and hit the other one. Uh, and, I, you know, it was a slow speed collision into my dad's um, shelf where he had a bunch of tools and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I knew I was in for it. You know who my first call was? After my sister ran away screaming. <laughs> she was not part of this at all. And after I, you know, did everything I could to try to fix it and realize there's no way you can fix holes in metal, my first call was to my grandfather. To my grandmother. Because in that space and time, my sense was, is they're the ones that didn't show me the greatest love. Who's your instinct? What's your instinct say? Think about it. When things really start to fall apart, what's your instinct? Who do you go to? Why? And now bring it around. The one who has shown us the greatest love that can ever be shown is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Period. And you're like, well, it happened a long time ago, and it's a big idea, and, and he didn't know me. Yes, he did. God knows you. God created you. It is personal. And that atoning sacrifice wasn't just some big idea. It was with you in mind. And that is the love that he gives every one of us. You and I are beloved. The question is, will we acknowledge it and will we see it? How will we respond to the love of God? You are beloved, not because of what you do, simply because God chose to love you. So how do we respond? Just as God loves us, we are called to love one another. And this is where it gets a little tricky. Because again, another idea that we toss out there, oh yeah, we're supposed to love one another, unless they're being a jerk. Or, well, I don't really agree with that one. Well, you, I don't like how they did that. I don't like the way they dress. I don't like, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, we're going to love them, but from over here, and they just stay over there. And They tend to find a lot of excuses to not love. When John is saying, Beloved, you who are loved by God, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. It's twice in this passage. That's where it begins. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because God loves us. Because God loves us, Love one another. 
kind of ties a nice little bow around it, doesn't it? It's not a confusing commandment. It doesn't leave a lot of room for us to manipulate it and adjust it. Love is how we respond to the love that we've been given. What we have been given by God, we are to give to the people around us. The God that views us as ones who he loves has called us to view others as ones worthy, not just of God's love, but of mine as well. You see where this can get tricky? How well do we do at this, honestly? Here's the thing about church. Here's the thing about a people, a community, where Christ is the center, where we've called and come together to follow Christ, is that we, at the foundation of that, are to approach each other in the way that God has approached us, with love. And a church that's willing to love one another without condition is able to actually connect, not just as people, but as a community connecting to God. What would it be like to be in a place, in a community, where the love of God is so central that it is a gift that we give each other? A gift that we give each other sacrificially. The love that God gave to us through his son found its form in what? An atoning sacrifice. It was a gift that carried a cost. This is where it can get heavy. We like the conditions that we put on our love and our approach to each other. I will accept you and acknowledge you and care for you if. That is not the way God approaches us. And it is not the way that he is calling us to approach each other. Does it say that all will agree with me and those that agree with me therefore shall be loved? No. I mean, the story of Jesus' life, by the time he goes to the cross, pretty much everyone in the whole world had denied him, walked away, scorned, or mocked him. Everyone. He still went. And this is about our motives. This isn't about everybody else. This is about me. This is about us. Yes, people will get on my nerves they will get on your nerves. I'm probably one that's gotten on your nerves. Love overcomes. It's not about all the things we agree or disagree on. It's about looking at another person and recognizing them as created by God and worthy, not only of God's love, but mine. Are we willing to approach each other in this way? To give the gift of love without condition. To look at someone who is different us than us and say, you're worthy. Your life matters. To 
give the grace that comes. And Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. His love actually changed things. Love still changes things. If you've ever known forgiveness, I think you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever done wrong and had someone choose to forgive you, you've experienced a gift of love. If you've ever forgiven, you have given a gift of love. This isn't some big heady concept, way off in space, hard to come by. It's how we look at the people around us. And yes, that means sometimes when you're driving down the road and you see somebody and they do whatever they're doing and your instinct is just to say, jerk. Maybe you say it. And then you come back and you say, you know what? Chill out. It looks like setting down the grudge. It looks like trusting God with some other people instead of judging them. It looks like viewing others as worthy instead of casting them out. And I think that's the kind of love the world needs. I think it needed it when Jesus gave it. I think that love that Jesus gave on the cross fundamentally changed the world in every way. You can prove it historically that the world shifted in that moment. We're here as a testimony of how it has worked inside of us. That love is power. It is strength. It is what will sustain us through challenge, through tension, through turmoil. It's what we need when the world's a mess. Love is the right choice. It's where we start. And we trust the Spirit to build on it. And what happens when we choose to love? Look at what it says. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. No one has ever seen God, but if you love one another, then God is amongst you. God lives, brings life into that community and his love is made known, perfected, crystallized, tangible, real, eternal among us. When we see, we see God, when we experience God's love in others, let it sink in. We experience and see God when we receive the gift of love from others. We experience and see God when we give the gift of love to others. You can't get around it. Whoever does not love does not know God. It's in the passage. Love is the key to the community of God's people. It is a key to our relationship and our connection with God. It is a key that unlocks that deep, strong, powerful, full, whole relationship that we have between us and God and that we can have between us and other people. If we reject love, we reject the core of who God says he is. It's a big deal. 
How will people know God? He will be revealed in us when we love one another. And this isn't about the other. This is about us, our choice. Will we walk in love? Will we choose love? Will we sacrifice? Because that's what love does. And right now, we've used the word love a whole bunch, and maybe we need a definition for it. And to do that, I think Paul gives us a great one. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable. Love is not resentful. Love not, does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. What does love look like? How are we to approach the people around us? You heard it, patience, kindness. Arrogance isn't the way. Rudeness does not show love. It's not about what we want or what we think we can get from others. It's not about our own way. It's not about being irritable or resentful. It's about the truth. What does that look like? Well, here's the simple truth. God created everyone, and there is good in everyone. It's easy to see the bad. It's easy to find the bad. It's easy to put bad on people they don't even deserve. But what does good look like? What is it that person values? What is their unique contribution to, to life, society? What did God create them for? How can the gift of love help unlock that? It's finding truth in people. There's going to be people you run into that really push your buttons. That really, you just look at it and I know it's wrong, should never do that. And yes, there's truth in that. But people are not defined by their wrongs. Because of Christ, people can be defined by his love for them over and above their sin. People are used to being condemned. They expect people in the church to condemn them because we have done so. I encourage you to surprise people with love and see where that gets us. I believe it is a truer expression of how God loves us and how God approaches us. And I believe it is a truer expression of what God has called us to be as a community of believers. Ones who love first where love is always the right choice. Where we don't give up. Because God never gives up. I don't know what you're pulling away from this message today. It's a big idea on a common subject. It hits a lot of buttons, a lot of spaces. There's a lot of ways you can hear a message like this and say, well, but no, 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 no. Please hear that. Think about it. What are all those no's coming from? Loving another, giving the gift of love to another can be a very hard thing and a scary thing to do. And we don't always know how to do it. That's why... That 1 Corinthians passage can be so helpful. 
Because you know what wasn't in there? You know, all the patience and kindness. That's all about how we approach the world. That's things we can control in and of ourselves. It doesn't mean you go solve everybody's problems for them. I don't think that is actually an expression of, of love. I think that's expression sometimes of what we want. I think sometimes, and I know I'm one who can fall in the trap of arrogance to say, I know better than you how to be you. I don't think that gets anybody anywhere. Sometimes love is just a willingness to listen. It's a willingness to engage. It's a willingness to sit in the pain and the tension. It's a willingness to acknowledge that maybe this person doesn't want anything to do with us, but it doesn't make them evil. It doesn't make them wrong or bad. It's where they are. And they're still worthy of love. It's a willingness to acknowledge that maybe the problem isn't just them. It's me. I can't do anything about them, but I can do something about me. It's not about imposing our will. It's about letting the truth of who God is come forward in the relationships we have with each other. And the result is this genuine, deep, and true connection that can bear all things, endure all things, hope through all things that doesn't end. And if you ever want a picture of heaven, I think it looks like that. And that's a good thing. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we pray that your love would be made known to us in new and significant ways. Lord, that your spirit would speak to all those who are listening. Lord, that you would show us what your love looks like. Help us to have that, that deep and powerful connection that can only come when we receive the gift of love. Lord, help us to be people who give the gift of love to others, knowing that that gift is the gift of life. That gift is a reflection, a showing others who you are. Lord, help us to see that the choice to love is not dependent on everything out there. It's about how we choose to approach the world. Will we love as you have loved us? And Lord, as a believers, as a community, help us to stand firmly on this foundation of love that you have provided, to take seriously the command that you've given to love one another, to do it without condition, to do it without expectation, to do it with all the kindness and patience and endurance and everything that, that 1 Corinthians 13 shares with us. And in so doing, Lord, may we see you. May your love be perfected in us as we love each other. Lord, this is your space and this is your church. May your will be done. And as in your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.